So good morning. So my name is Simon, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the future of front-end engineering. So, um, so we're going to start with sort of the most well-known front-end interface, and that is the web. So, uh, so this is a gentleman named Tim, and he's sort of the uh, known as the creator of the web. And and this goes back to you know 1989, 1990. And, and the web was really uh, just, just a series of documents uh, connected together, hyperlinked together, right? Um, if you think about it, uh, it was really created to display uh, pages of text linked to other pages of text. And it was really just, just a, a, ver a very simple document viewer, right? Every, every document had a URL. And, and the web kind of looked like this in, in the early days, right? So this is, um, this is Yahoo from uh, 1997. And, and you can see it, it's, it's basically a, a, a glorified set of links, right? It, very informational. But if you fast forward into what the, what the web has evolved into um, over the years, you know, we, we've added layers and layers of technology onto this document viewer to turn it into to a platform for delivering software, for, for a platform for delivering like rich user interfaces, right? I mean, it started with like CSS and then you know JavaScript, and, and we added just uh, just various uh, various technologies to it, and and we end up with things like this. So this is uh, this is kind of your modern web. This is your modern sort of immersive experience that you get on the web, which is very different than a, a document viewer, right? Another example would be like uh, so Google Street View. And, and the point I'm making about this is that this is not really what the web was designed for. Um, and, and a lot of smart engineers worked to turn it into a platform that is, that is very different than, than what its origins were. And so we'll, we'll come back to the web as a platform. Uh, but first, I want to talk about sort of interfaces in general today. So you know, we have uh, we have the smartphone, we have the uh, you know, full-size computers and wearables and, and, and watches. And, and I kind of want to focus on mobile for a little while. Uh, but, but if you think about what are the challenges with front-end engineering in general that we face as developers, right? We have uh, the user's expectations are very high, right? Users are used to uh, very smooth performing interfaces with, with animations and 60 frames a second and multi-touch and, and, and a, a very immersive experience that, that we then as developers have to live up to and we have to create those, those interfaces to meet those expectations and we have multiple platforms to do it on. We have, and, and every platform sort of uses these incons inconsistent technologies. And building for mobile is difficult and it's expensive. And so how do large, how do large organizations approach this? Well, I feel like you have to choose a compromise. So you can either compromise your developer productivity, and what I mean by that is you would split your development team into three camps, right? You would have your web, your iOS, and your Android at the minimum. And then uh, that, that essentially cuts your developer productivity in a third, or you know, another way to look at it is that like triples your costs, your engineering costs. Um, you could reduce the feature scope. You can compromise on feature scope. And so you can, you know, a lot of companies will build the full-blown system on the web and they'll build a scaled-down version on mobile. And then if you want to do something that's outside of the scope of what you can do on native mobile, you have to, you know, redirect you to the web. Um, or you compromise the user experience and you use a kind of HTML web view hybrid type of technology that allows you to, to build rapidly across web and mobile, but, it, but it, um, at the expense of uh, the sort of user experience. And so when you think about choosing your compromise, these are the decisions that, that larger engineering teams have to make. Unless you have unlimited funds, you can just triple your, your engineering team and kind of build everything, um, build everything out. But I want to talk about the last one, about the web view one, because, because that's really, uh, that really came with some promises. The promise of the, of the sort of web view based application or the HTML based app was that you could kind of write once and deploy to web, to iOS, and to Android. And so back in 2009, we, have, uh, we had this, this new thing called HTML5, and, and it's because kind of Flash was dying. Flash couldn't really keep up with mobile back then. And Chrome, was, uh, Chrome was, was really coming in to fill that gap. Chrome was, was really pushing the web forward at that time. And, and Chrome started this sort of second browser war, as we call it, um, 
And so everybody thought HTML was the, or HTML5 was the answer to everything, right? We were putting that everywhere. And, and, and in some ways it was, right? And so you had PhoneGap and Cordova and these various uh, app building platforms that were trying to harness what we had on the web and put it into a mobile package, right? Uh, and, and, and they made some really strong cross-platform promises. And so um, to give you an example of that, so we have uh, Facebook who didn't really have a successful mobile app at all in about 2010. And so they, they had something on iOS. They didn't have anything on Android. And so they decided to, to get on this HTML5 sort of bandwagon. They decided to jump on to this hybrid technology idea. And so uh, in 2010, they released this uh, hybrid app built uh, with one code base. And they released it for iOS and for Android. And this is kind of what it looked like. And it, it had 1.5 stars on the App Store. Like it was, it was like a well-known kind of famous failure. And, um, and because it, it didn't have the feel that people expect on mobile, right? It was just, it felt like a web page just kind of stuffed into a mobile app and it, and it, and it wasn't there. It didn't have the experience that people wanted. So, um, so this is sort of the, the famous quote from Zuck in 2012, which is basically that uh, our biggest mistake was betting too heavily or too much on HTML5. And so, you know, granted, maybe they were a little ahead of their time, and there may have been other factors. But like, ultimately, Facebook went back, and they formed a native team for iOS, and they formed another native team for Android. And uh, th that's kind of the solution that you have to do when you're in that situation. Um, but the point I want to make is, if you're in the top 100, right, on the App Store, I mean, if, if you're at that scale, or you're competing at that scale, uh, sacrificing the user experience isn't an option. You just can't do it. And so, um, you know, if you think about what Facebook ultimately did, which is having these separate teams, that is not a perfect solution. And the reason, you know, for one, uh, not, not every company can afford to do that. For two, you end up with these siloed engineering teams that are working on separate technologies. They're, they're not even able to review each other's code. You're not really able to push features through to all of them at the same time. So a lot of people will roll out the iOS feature first and a few months later roll out Android feature because it's just totally different technologies. Um, and, then, and then you have to try to keep this UX parity between all of them, right? You want the same user experience on all the platforms, give or take, and, uh, but you, you need to go through it all again with each separate team. <clears throat> so it's an imperfect solution, right? So what is the ideal solution? What is the ideal solution to kind of cover all of your, your front end interfaces? So here's what we want. We want one expressive language or framework across web, desktop, and mobile. Uh, we want performance. We need performance, right? We, need, uh, we would like a reasonable amount of code reuse uh, between, the, between the platforms while maintaining the natural look and feel of each platform. iOS should feel like iOS, and Android should feel you know, material or feel Android style. Uh, and the same with web, right? <clears throat> and we want excellent user experiences, and we want like smooth 60 frames a second. Like We need that. So, um, so I'm going to go back to the web for a minute. We'll talk about React briefly. So, um, you know, if we, if we fast forward a few years after kind of the HTML5 craze, uh, you're about mid-2013. And at that time, Angular is the dominant web framework, for good reason. And so React is, is new, and it's really controversial. And so the early adopters of React were kind of facing, um, they, they, were, they were fueling this, this innovation that, that like, I have never really seen in, in the front end space, but it was really cool to see kind of the, uh, the ideas that were coming out of, the, out of the community at that time, but it was, um, it was very unpopular, some of these ideas. Uh, another way to put that is the way Dan Abramoff put it, which is like React was, is packed with ideas that were radical at the time of its introduction, and I think that's really true. And so, you know, when we think about React, and I won't go into the technical depths of this, but of like why it was fundamentally different, but if you think about declarative UI and, and virtual DOM and some of the sort of like, uh, like especially view being a function of state, right? Some of these principles were, were really new and they were, they were not MVC and they were not object oriented and, and they were moving the industry in a different direction and, and, it, and it wasn't quite ready for that. But I want to focus on, uh, I want to focus on one important concept that, that we're going to understand to kind of move move on to, to mobile, which is this. So if you look at this code, um, and, and this is kind of like some basic React code, you can think of this as like a container uh, with some text inside. And so the container has some padding, and the text has some styling. But ultimately, there is, um, it tells you very little about the underlying display medium. Right? There is nothing browser specific about this. It's basically describing a very generic 
component. And so um, another way to put that is that the browser is just an implementation detail for React. So you could render this, I mean, you could render this to HTML, you could render this to uh, a phone, you could render this to, to a PDF, right? You could totally render this exact same view with the same padding and the same style onto almost any medium, and people were doing that. And so, the, you know, the, now we're about 2014-ish, and you had like Flipboard, which was rendering to Canvas, rendering React elements to Canvas. You had Netflix, which was rendering to smart TVs. They had this kind of gibbon, uh, as they called it, uh, interface for smart TVs that was not HTML. It, wasn't, it was not a web view. Um, and then like you had some like crazy ideas like rent, like using React to render into terminal or console. Um, and so like w the idea that came out of that is this universal front end that you had one way to describe things that, that you kind of had a set of primitives for, with which you could describe um, user interface in general, right? And so what came out of that, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, is React Native. Because the idea was if we can remove the if we can remove the web and the CSS and the HTML out of the picture and we can just describe our views how we want them to render on any medium, we can just render that to mobile. And so I want to show you an example of that. Um, and so this is something we built for this conference. And so this is built 100% uh, in React Native. Um, so I encourage you to go and, and download this app and, and get a feel for this, uh, for how it works. And, and it should feel absolutely native. Um, and it's, it's written in 100% modern JavaScript. It took us about uh, two months uh, using two developers, kind of part-time working between, between client projects. Um, the, the tech stack that we use to build this is uh, Redux, uh, React Navigation, React Native Elements, which gives us some really cool kind of cross-platform uh, you know, tab bars and drawers and, and various things. And, uh, and we, used, we use a type system called Flow. So, so we rolled this out uh, for this conference as, as kind of a, a good example of, of what kind of modern, building modern interfaces in React Native feels like. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. So React gives us almost exactly what we're, what we're looking for. It gives us an expressive language, um, a consistent framework across web, Android, iOS, and, and even Windows. So, and, and, and that list is growing. So it gives us performance that we're looking for. It's not 100% like pure native, pure Swift, or, or pure Java performance, but it's, it's extremely close. It's so close that your, your users wouldn't notice a difference, even on low-end devices. And that's, and that's probably a defining factor of why this works. Um, we got a reasonable amount of code reuse. We, we can maintain the native look and feel for each platform, or we can create our own branded look and feel. Um, and we really get this excellent user experience. But the other thing I want to talk about besides the user experience is the developer experience. And so, uh, you know, since we're developers in this room, what we want is, uh, so, so React Native gives us almost zero compile time. Like, you will not spend time compiling your app uh, unless you're ready to ship it to the App Store and you need to create an APK. Um, you get this hot reloading. You save a file and, uh, and the view reloads. You can, even, you can even do it at the component level so that you save a, you save a, a, a file or a module and one piece of your view reloads, and, and that's really powerful. Um, you can develop on these multiple devices simultaneously. You, you can have your code window in front of you. You can have an iOS device on your left. You can have an Android device on your right. And as you save your code, both of the devices update, so you can, you can literally develop cross-platform at the same time. And so... You know, you get this layout system that, that's kind of inspired from the web, this flex, Flexbox layout system, which is really powerful. You get a lot of debugging and logging capabilities that works really nicely. Um, but, but this is kind of the experience. So this is the, the part I want to show you, which is like, you, you save code on the right, and this is, uh, and the device on the left just automatically refreshes. Like, as soon as you make a change, like as soon as in this case we just change the text at the top, and then, and this is real time, and the, device, and the, the view refreshes, and it feels like you're developing on web. Um, it, we're, we're trying to bring the best of what you have in the web development experience, bring it over to mobile. And so that's, that's the goal. And so we use modern JavaScript. Uh, we, you know, we get kind of like, this could be a talk in and of itself, but, but I feel like JavaScript has a bad history, it has a bad reputation, but there's some really powerful um, modern constructs that we have available to us, including like my absolute favorite is probably async await. I mean, JavaScript brings a way of doing asynchronous uh, event-driven development in, in a way that's uh, very useful for, for UI. But 
I feel like choosing React Native is a business choice too. So if you think about it, if you, if you run a team of developers and um, you, you want them to be, like essentially you want to maximize, you, you need to ship quality product, right? But you also want to kind of maximize the use of your development team, of your resources. And so splitting people into siloed teams is not the way to do that. Um, if you can use, you know, if you can use one set of technology, which is what we're doing, you can, you can hire and train every person with the same skill set. And then you can shift or load balance resources between projects. And so, you know, even between web and mobile. And so one of the sort of um, defining moments when I was, when I took some of my guys who had been trained on mobile the whole time and I, and I put them on a web and I said, you know, I know it's a little bit different, but the, the principles of React are the same. And within 24 hours turnaround, uh, we, we were shipping product on web and it was really, it, it makes a massive difference from, from running, from a standpoint of running a team. But, but if you think about like where is front end engineering going from here, like, like what's next? So there's a few trends that I'm noticing that we'll talk about briefly is, um, so, so for one, we're moving things into JavaScript world. We're moving things out of, you know, we kind of move things out of HTML already. We're not writing HTML in React world. Uh, but the other thing is that we're trying to get rid of CSS, at least on the web, right? And we're moving our styles into JavaScript. And we want to describe, ultimately, if, if we have a component, if we have a, you know, if we have a, a segmented tab view, right? We want to put our styles and our view and our logic all together because it's one component, right? It has one purpose. And, and, it, and it gives us modular code. The, the, the strong types is something that, like, I could do a whole talk on that, but I feel that the uh, industry is moving away from kind of these dynamic languages, and, and we're trying to find the sweet spot between strongly typed languages that give you compile time guarantees uh, and, the, and, and not getting in your way, having a type system that doesn't get in your way and slow you down and, and be verbose and make you, uh, and, and make you like, um, uh, explicitly type everything. And so we're getting this kind of, these, these, ty these, uh, these type systems that have type inference, and TypeScript is a great example. We use Flow. So, uh, so types are, are coming in as a trend to front-end development, and we're sh we have this shift away from imperative programming and object-oriented programming style and to more f functional and declarative style, and, and maybe that's a topic beyond the scope of this talk, but, uh, but I kind of want to mention that, that I feel like the, the industry is pressing forward that way. And so our powerful build tools, if you think about Webpack and, and tree shaking and dead code elimination, right? So we're able to just require the, the modules that we need and our build system is smart enough to eliminate the pieces we don't need and ship the minimum amount of code necessary and bundled in a way that is optimal. And so like if you get a chance to, to, uh, to look into prepack, prepack is, is another library that does some pretty uh, amazing things at compile time with your code. We also kind of have this, this movement for new languages, which I think are really powerful. And so like Scala has been around, Dart never quite took off, but it, but it, is, uh, it is gaining some traction. We've got Elm, which is a, a really cool language. All of these compile into JavaScript. So if you want to write your interfaces with these technologies, but you, but you don't want to write JavaScript, there are options. And, and my favorite one, you know, Kotlin is pretty amazing, but my favorite one is Reason. Uh, which, is, which is a really new sort of functional, uh, it, it's a really cool, powerful open source language that's, that's out there, um, also kind of beyond the scope of this talk. But uh, so if I think about front end engineering, I think it, we're kind of going through uh, a sort of renaissance. I feel like we're going, you know, we were trying to figure things out for a long time, and I feel like now we're moving as an industry forward into, into some really cool things. And one of the things is developer experience, like a focus on developer experience in a way that we're, we're kind of like removing these barriers to success. And, and those were in place for a long time, and our language is evolving. So I think it's a pretty exciting time to be a front end engineer. And so I uh, just want to say thank you uh, for listening. And uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself. So, uh, so my name is Simon, and I run a team, and we build React Native for startups. So we're essentially a software house for focusing on mobile apps. Uh, if you need a mobile app, if, you're, um, you know, if, you're, if your startup needs uh, some, you know, wants to talk about React Native, then let us know. So thank you very much for listening.